button has changed and right. it has we've got the scary we are live section up um so in we case are you are dialing it right the, now the tweet is sent so Ooh, we should be good to start yeah i uh, i just enabled that on my tweet deck i actually had a uh, test tweet um configure that says you know for go live and all of that and then my daughter came in one day and pressed it um, luckily just once and I realized that's a terrible idea so my stream deck no longer has any live buttons but yeah I've, I've so, heard of the most amazing tweet live hack in the world so okay. uh, a developer I'm not sure where he's from uh, he he wanted to build the habit of getting up every morning at 5 55 a.m so what he did is that he yeah. he yeah he set up a, an automated tweet to go out at 6 10 mm-hmm. if he's not wake up so the automated tweet out goes every morning at 6 10 that says i am still in bed reply to this tweet for, to this tweet for five dollars on paypal oh wow <laughs> so oh, so it, it it really made him mm. <laughs> try to be there so mm. I, I, I find that very interesting so yeah good morning yeah. or good what? afternoon everybody or good evening for some or people. Evening, I know we yeah. sometimes get some people from uh, Australia that join us very late. Um, Docker, you can do the intro today. I can do the intro today. So let me just set up, set up start up Twitch on my own side so I can see what are we looking <laughs> at. Um, uh, I will ask the first question to the audience for the people in chat. Let us know if our sound is okay. We want to make yes, sure that the audio please. between us is good so we don't end up talking about the things throughout mm. today and, it, and it's going to just have horrible sound. In the meantime... Welcome to another edition to Dev Beard Ops or Bean Streaming or basically your 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 regular weekly show with the two bearded ball guys about technology, AWS, cloud, and well, random geeky nerdy things. Um, my name is Darko, and with me it's Kobus Bernard. Kobus and I are both developer advocates at AWS, so our job is to talk to you, our audience, the community members, to scream at cameras, teach you, entertain you, and a whole lot of other things. So, including listening to you, including to, oh, of course. <laughs> well, <laughs> yes, we do. That's that's one of, <laughs> one of our parts. Things things we do. So, um, welcome. I hope you are all having a great Wednesday. <clears throat> it's a Wednesday. It's Wednesday, Wednesday, the third of March, twenty twenty one. And today's topic is going to be something pretty interesting, at least pretty interesting for us, and we hope to make it interesting for you. Kubis and I are going to spend the brunt of today talking about. <laughs> the thing that seems very boring in nature, like if you if you mention it, it seems like oh, okay, wow, that that's fun. But it's actually very important. We're going to talk about testing your software. Um, and let me actually um, before I do my intro spiel, uh, Kobus, um, do you have to introduce? You, you don't have to introduce yourself. I, I told you. Who <laughs> you are. I just have to apologize. Um, apologize. As you might have noticed now, I uh, muted myself and I will do that during the course of the session today in case uh, I go into a coughing fit. Um, yeah. I actually went for a COVID test. Uh, when was it? Sunday or Monday? Okay. Um, just to confirm because I've had this weird, and we all have it in the house, like throat infection, coughing, fever, all of those things. Not fun. Um, start up with our uh, little one-year-old who has got uh, croup. So it's a fairly standard thing for kids. Okay. But uh, apparently, it's just a nasty throat infection. Um, it's okay. not flu. It's not something. It's not COVID. So I will be coughing and uh, muting myself every now and again. So if you see me start talking very animated like this, <laughs> you are muted. <laughs> please wave at me. And, oh well, not wave at me. Dark, you can wave at me. Um, yeah, and then uh, let me know what's going on. <laughs> but um, yeah, I don't. Um, I don't think intros are too needed. Other than if you have a problem internally as well for your amusement, we have both yeah. been called by each other's names, and not only that, we have both been attributed the other's work at some point in time as well so yes. people went uh, thanks blah 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 for that thing and you're like uh no no, no that's darker <laughs> that's the other guy um, yeah. yeah so yeah H- hence hence the not cobus and the not darko here because yes. we like to be oh. the opposites um and it's weird like i i i we we make it a stupid meme but people actually mistake us people call me cobus and people called him mm-hmm. darko and i know we don't look that much like we're just bald and, and bearded um, but yeah, otherwise it's, it's, it's fine. So that's, that's the whole meme for, for, for well, you people here. Te- yeah. te- technically you're bold and technically I'm lazy. So this is, this is a lot of effort. Uh, okay. 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 I, I'm, I'm just losing my hair. So that's fine. Um, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> so, um, software testing, um, yes. that's a very interesting topic. um, 
now this if you're a developer in the audience welcome uh, if you're not a developer also welcome because this also refers to you no matter what part of your technology um, stage of your life you are in um, this will make it important to you software testing or yeah. testing in general is very important um, let me actually try to step a, take a step back to a, a time long ago um, when software testing was different so in 1985, if you would release a product to the market, you would release it in something like this, right? A ROM cartridge. It's read only. You you pack it up, you put it in 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 in, in, a, in a box and sell it. What happens if you made a mistake? What happens if you have ship out broken software and you have just printed out tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of of your Super Mario Brothers cartridges? you tend to lose a lot. That's a problem, right? Yep. Um, rolling back from that was, was I wouldn't call it impossible, but it was very expensive and very difficult. Then you move forward, you do something like this. Oh, you have your floppy disk, right? Oh, you want people to upgrade to your latest operating system. Amazing, right? These are not read-only, but they're relatively complicated to replace, right? If you sell some mm. a box of MS-DOS 6, to somebody and then it's broken that person can go back to the store and ask for a new one you can kind of repurpose the discs because you can kind of write on them again well, it's a bit easier if, if you have the sticker for it if you have the sticker for it and this one is this one is it's read only, read only i believe it's read only yeah yes. this one you read only up, uh writable ones have a little gap at the drop and yes you yeah. can actually cut the little you thing out there if you want to make it <laughs> readable yeah uh, so you 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 oh, have sorry, writable. writable yeah mm. so you can kind of it's, it's it gets better as we move on into the world of of, of modern technology, digital distribution, getting the internet. The, the internet, yeah, the internet's a series of tubes. Um, the internet makes it makes it makes it easier for you to roll back on a bad piece of software, right? If you make a mistake on your mm. website, you can make a change. It's less expensive, which is good for everybody, right? But at the same time, you need to be as diligent to your small static website as the people were diligent making Super Mario Brothers on a cartridge. Because the worst thing you can, that can happen to your audience is that they receive a bad experience. They receive a bad piece of software and you just give up on it. I actually did this today. I've, I've tried to install one application and um, it was, there was a problem with logging in. Apparently this version that I've downloaded, it just has a bad login thing. I have to wait for a while until they get released a new one. I'm not gonna wait. I'm just gonna find mm -hmm. the new equivalent. Yep application mm. and i'm gonna use it so testing is important so this is what we're gonna be talking about today we're gonna to talk about how testing your code looks in different stages mm. of, your, of your development let's take a step back um well before we continue there's a couple of hellos from the audience here hello everybody welcome hello. Uh, we appreciate you being back uh and watching us live on stream um E9TKI says, I am a web developer looking to move into DevOps. How do you recommend I start that journey? Okay, Kobus, kick it off. <laughs> so I want to take that one because uh, I uh, used to be a developer. No, I actually did software development um, and then moved into the whole de DevOps world from that side, which apparently is not as common as system administrators moving into the DevOps world. Um, and basically what it boiled down to is that Everybody wants to write code, but nobody wants to worry about configuring the code and deploying the code and monitoring the code. So typically a good way to get started there is to say, listen, well, let me look at a project that work. Is this something, or a pet project, is this some way I can uh, automate this or just make the configuration of the app easier? For example, if there's a config file with a hard-coded value or a secret for a database password, because that's very common. Figure out a way how you can remove that from the source file and the source control system as well, and inject it upon deployment, um, rather. And because that way you can say, okay, cool, that's at least some way to start you into the route for config management. It'll also force you along the route of like, how do I build up a CI CD pipeline or basically just a build and deploy pipeline if you go very, very basic. Um, and that gets you that way. And then once your app is up and running, you can start worrying about, okay, how do I look at the log files instead of SSHing onto the box? That'll read, uh, lead you down the path of how do you do log aggregation, what log systems are available, how do you centralize them and process them? So those are some easy ways. And the thing that gives you like the most mileage there is that 
do something that shows value to the company. Because typically what happens is if you do something that people don't perceive as valuable, they don't want you to spend time on it. So figure out something that's a pain point for more than one person, preferably the developers, because that'll make them happy and that'll make them want to use it. Um, which we'll actually talk about a bit later today, given the the thing that I'm currently busy working on that has got a lot of testing in it. Um, so, and once you get the developers to buy into this, that immediately shows value. And then you can start spending a little bit more time on that rather than just spending a little bit of after hours or a few minutes a day on it. And here's the thing, you are a developer. You know what your developers want. <clears throat> you know how to oh, yeah. remove the thorn, the problems your developers have. So, hey, use that knowledge and build systems, build automation techniques, build... Um, build tooling to help your developers just focus on their code, focus on the business thing, on the thing that makes your product different, um, rather than having them to focus around building pipelines and whatnot. But hmm. in all truth, to get started, um, there's a lot of workshops out there. Like on, on AWS, there's a couple of serverless DevOps workshops that you can have a look into. Hmm. These things are around building pipelines, around how you can do things. But if you ha if you if you are not if you don't know concrete what is DevOps or if you cannot if you cannot look into your mirror into the mirror right now and explain to yourselves E9 TKI this is DevOps um, go read a book called uh, the Phoenix Project it will show you what is it what life is with DevOps and what is it without DevOps so check that out could help you a lot. Mm. Thank you for the questions. And also feel free to keep keep the questions coming in. We are here for you. We are here to help and answer questions, uh, discuss. So it's not, this is not the presentation. This is not pre-recorded. This is just Kobus and I chatting and talking about things. We have some things kind of ready uh, to show, but overall it's more of a, a discussion. We have not prepared for this too much. <laughs> um, okay, Kobus, tell me, tell me yes. something. Um, let's talk about failing software. That's a very positive thing to talk about, right? Oh, um, yes. <laughs> there you go. Sorry, just sending the, the, the book details the quickly book. to the okay. chat for those that aren't aware. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the book. Testing uh, software. Book. Yeah, testing yes. software. So, Kobus, let me ask you something. Um, where does software fail? Where does your code fail? Ooh. Everywhere. Um, everywhere. Right. Yeah. Literally everywhere. So, starting at the very basic, um, checking out code. Uh, well, okay, firstly, let's make work with assumption, just stating it up front that you have got some kind of version control system in place and you're working from that. Uh, footnote here is I have worked on systems where there were no process in place. There were folders yeah. on a shared machine somewhere. And yes, I can chase you off my lawn. I'm that old. Um, <laughs> but let's say you work on a, uh, a code base. And okay. what you do is you check out and you are on the main branch and you go ahead and say, enter build and it breaks. Or... What is more common, the code might actually be able to compile, but guess what? Your developer environment isn't set up for it. So mm -hmm. boom, it breaks. Mm -hmm. um, that's normally like the first start of all your woes. And then lastly, where typically it breaks with the most impact and the most um, attention is in production, where yeah. you've got, you release some new code and all of a sudden a nobody can log in or everybody starts complaining on Twitter that something's broken or worse yet, you've got something misconfigured and you leak some data out, etc. So, and then there's that whole space in between. That's the worst kind of failure, I think, right? Uh, so it, it is very important to try to fail. So fa we say that we have all the testing tools in place and it's easy to replace code, but it's it's there's a massive difference mm. where your code fails. Think about it. How expensive is your code to be bad if I just add something here, right? My 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 uh, text editor, right? I just changed the function name or just changed the definition mm. thing in Python, and it will break. It broke. It says, "Hey Darko, you have an invalid syntax on line five. How expensive is that? Is that? It's not. It's it's almost free. I basically just go here and uh, change the the the, the mis mistake I made and save my file. Mm. It took me a second. Yeah. It may take me a couple of seconds or minutes, but." The overall cost of this mistake is nothing, right? Yeah. And having a having a, a good text editor, something something that will detect broken yeah. code, is a great way to start, right? So oh yeah, uh, that's the first place you fail. Um, but you mentioned you mentioned a thing that I I didn't even think about. Um, you mentioned a thing called source control. Yes. It's 
So for, for, for those of you who are not aware or are not using source control, that's your Gits, that's your SVNs, that's your Mercurials, and all of the, all of the locations where you can actually properly version code hmm. with other things. Now, well, let's just quickly clarify proper versioning. is just being okay. able to store the code somewhere. We've got the entire history as it changed over time to yep. be able to see what happened. And if you need to go back to something, you can go back to it. And that's also when you revert for, for example, version one, yep. it's somehow marked inside that system. And everybody knows this is the set of files for version one. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things that, that, um, that, that the version control gives you is gives you the ability to actually uh, have some, um, well, there's a mention here by Happy Light, rollbacks. Yeah, absolutely rollbacks. But one great thing about version control is if you are using it properly, right? Mm. Is the ability that you have these wonderful things called pull requests and code reviews that a, that a good buddy of yours that looks like you can have a look at your bad written code and say, hey, Darko, yeah, uh, mm -hmm. this will not work. I have more experience in this. I've noticed that you didn't <clears throat> include this or I didn't do that or this is mm -hmm. not the way we code. Or better yet, that. you've got a bot that does that for you. That tells we you, hey, listen, hey, listen, buddy, um, hey, this listen, code yeah. is not formatted properly. It doesn't compile. It fails. It doesn't adhere to the standard. Uh, please go fix before you waste our time. Correct, correct. So yeah. the first, fail, fa first place you fail uh, is your text editor, your yes. browser, your IDE, your Vim, your Emacs. If it shows yeah. you an error saying, hey, this is not a good syntax for this language, excellent. You fix it, you, you make a change, it costs zero money or, or almost no time. Second place, you commit that code. You push that code somewhere and you have somebody look at that code. Now, this is a bit more expensive because I, in essence, wasted Cobus's time. Or if yes. I didn't waste Cobus's time, I wasted a bot's CPU cycles. So well, and and your own time and my own time, yeah. So there is a, a higher cost to that, right? So that that, mm. that, that is kind of the things. Uh, that's kind of the difference between failing in your editor and failing on a Git stage. So mm. two things. Before we move on, uh, addressing a couple of questions here. Um, the other software guy quest asks, "What is the name of the book on DevOps?" It's called mm -hmm. the Phoenix Project. There it is uh, on the screen. So um, lovely book. It's it's a novel. It's it's not the, it's not a technical book per se. It's not like it, does, it will not explain to you how to implement DevOps. It will sh give you a nice story about a company, a person who has who is suffering through lack of DevOps <laughs> and moving into into into, into proper DevOps. Mm. I, I always hate using the term DevOps because it's it's very overused and it's very wrongly used. So I try to use it as much as as, as good as I can. But and when you do use it, make sure you buy at least eight units of the DevOps because yeah, you can't do yeah. anything without the eight units of the DevOps. Exactly. And I, buy just DevOps. to clarify, we're joking. Of course. <laughs> DevOps is a subscription model now because it's 2021 mm. Cobus. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> so uh, and another question from, um, um, I'll be that boy. Oh, where you go? Um, or LJB that boy. Uh, how to contribute to open source while trying to learn DevOps concepts? Mm. Mm. I'll let you. I'll let you answer this one, Kobus. Okay. Oh, you're throwing me the easy questions. Yes, of course. I should have made myself coffee. I've got a very <laughs> empty, fun cup here, but uh, mm. it's uh, no no coffee in it. I refill um, mine. So the the short answer there is that if you're just starting out, this is going to be exceedingly difficult. Um, the reason is if you want to contribute, you need to provide value for them to want to merge your code um, and actually, you know, help solve some kind of problem. So the two things you want to, um, I think, learn here at the same time. The first one is how to interact with open source projects, because there are very specific ways that you can actually do that. Um, and what I'll do is as we go through today's session, I'll try and find a link. There is a site somewhere that shows you some easy projects that you can get into just for contributing. So the easiest way there is to start off with document fixes, like go fix some syntax, go fix some coding examples that miss uh, mistakes or some punctuation or add an example to a piece of code and send that through. Because I mean, those are the least impactful in terms of potential to break um, something kind of commits and pull request. Because if I change the document and it's not something that breaks or it doesn't break the code itself, yeah. it's easy. And also when you merge it, you can very easily eyeball and see, oh, this just makes the, doc uh, the documentation better. Let me merge it in versus, hey, this is some code change with tests with new feature that yeah. takes more time. So that gets you into the, how does open source work and how do you do those things? Then as you go along with regards to DevOps is like we said earlier, is figure out something that you can um, automate, um, 
do the configuration management, make better, solve a pain point for someone. That's normally a um, good place to start doing that because uh, remember DevOps isn't just the, hey, let me learn automation tools or hey, let me learn cloud or all of those things. There's a whole culture behind it. You might have heard of the um, term, the the CAMs or the COMs, which is the culture, the automation, um, the learning, the measurement and the sharing. So yeah. those tend to be the, the main parts of what is the DevOps culture. Um, so figure out where you can solve a pain point for someone in the company, because solving a pain point makes people more yeah. interested in what you've got to say and what you've got to offer. And that's how you start building the culture and automation and streamlining things and making things better. And also, if you are a user, if you work in a DevOps type environment and you use a tool, an open source tool that you benefit from, if you use, let's say, Terraform, if you use your um, <clears throat> various monitoring and observability tools that are open source, why not contribute to it? Why not say, hey, I can make this tool a bit better. Let me commit some code um, on that and, you know, make my mm. and somebody else's life a bit better. Yeah. Um, cool. Um, <clears throat> okay. Oh, Pedram. There's a question from Pedram. Oh, yeah. Um, Here's a fun one. Let me read. Uh, I was wondering how frequently code review sessions should be held. In our team, we are trying to do DevOps, but our code review sessions are just like longer daily standups. Should we go through the code line by line? I have a strong opinion on this one. Uh, so <laughs> I'll, I'll start off and feel free to, you know, slap me down. Um, you should go line by line. Absolutely. But do not make your commits a thousand lines long, right? One of the key parts about making a system that, it, yeah, it depends. Uh, one of the keys about making a system robust and, and, um, and, and, not failable or not, oh, I lost some camera. Um, <laughs> there we go, give me a second. Um, one, 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 one crucial thing about making a system robust and making it not fail as often is to make small reversible changes, right? So a small change that can be easily reversed compared to uh, some massive rework of your entire code base every time you make a change. Hence, making your code review process mm -hmm. up a thing you can do in, in eight hours, right? So uh, doing yeah. it doing it from time to time in small increments makes it makes it much better. Mm. And also if you, uh, what will happen is, and what we're talking about today is when you start introducing testing into your code base, mm -hmm. it makes these discussions much mm -hmm. easier because firstly, when you try and test code, what you'll quickly realize that is it changes the way you write code. Yeah. Um, very good example of this is what, that we'll dig into what I'm working on later is that um, I'm busy working on an internal utility um, that scrapes data from YouTube and then processes it and puts it in because I want to see what my metrics are in a way that I can't currently see it. Um, and then it stores it on some internal system. Yep. So initially what I did is I went off and decided, hey, I also want to learn Python. Let's go for it. I haven't, I've written some Python scripts, but nothing serious. Um, mm -hmm. Went off, build it. Uh, that was October. Spent about two, three weeks on it. It did what it was supposed to. Then came back yep. to it in January and I tried to use it. I had not run any tests and I eventually said, stuff this, I'm rewriting it in a language that I know being C sharp in this case, because I know how to write properly and also how to write tests, because I couldn't maintain my own code anymore. It was just this massive spaghetti mess of methods yeah. like literally this long. So it changes, it forces you to now start breaking things down as well. Right, right. Um, so so it, 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 again, smaller changes and try to review all of them. Again, the review is not just to make sure if people are doing it correctly, but it's also like mm. just a second pair of eyes. You know, when yeah. you when you build something, if somebody has a look into it, you can find mistakes that you haven't looked into because you're very biased on your code. Kobus and I did yesterday. His tool, he showed it to me, like, okay, how does this mm. work? This is how it you should run it. And we found issues. We found together because yep. I looked at some things that he wouldn't think of looking at. Not because he doesn't know, but because he was focused on some some specific thing. Hence mm -hmm. code reviews are just 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 great. And more importantly, I've hopefully written some unit tests now to cover those scenarios. Um, <laughs> it was cases like bad input where there's yeah. uh, the YouTube video, for some reason, mm -hmm. the analytics file has a space in front of the video ID. Don't yeah. ask me why, it's got that. Um, another interesting input is I tested with another teammate and he uses Hebrew in his titles, which for those not aware, actually is written right to left, not left to right like we do. And it's combined with English and Hebrew. So mm -hmm. what the, uh, the output now does interesting is I read that string incorrectly, but then when I write it again, the Hebrew part is the wrong way around because of some string culture issue at the moment that I haven't solved yet, but I know it's there. I've got a test for it now. The yeah. test fails and I will hopefully figure out how to go fix it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. 
um, yeah, so um, there's a couple of more quotes, uh, questions here for from the folks in the audience about uh, code reviews. Marcello, um, mm. how much does your co does your uh, approach to code review changes depending on the seniority of a person who developed the code? It doesn't matter, right? You can have a principal developer write a piece of code. A first time developer can come in, look into the code, and say, um, "What about this?" That's it. Like. Yep. Cobus is great at C sharp. I don't know C sharp for squat. I've written C sharp in 2007 last time. That's it. Mm. But Cobus showed me this little piece of code and I, I noticed, hey, you had something hard coded here. It's not that he didn't know about it, no matter how senior he is. So having senior developers this code, even reviewed mm. by a a junior developer, is a great way, number one, for the mm. for the code to be just reviewed. Number two, let the junior person learn. So yeah. it helps you learning by looking at somebody else's code and actually mm -hmm. discussing with that person, why this? Why did yeah. you do this? It's it's a great I mean, way. Uh, so yeah. just just to finish myself. So it's a great way to make you write code better. So here's the thing. Hot take. If I write my code and I know nobody will look at it, oh my, it's going to be horrible. It's going to be just a spaghetti code full of classes and methods that are used only once. But if I know that somebody's going to look at my code and say, hey, Darko, uh, why the long method? Um, I'm going to try to write it a bit better. So it helps, you know, uh, helps people, even senior mm. people, to write code a bit cleaner th that they know somebody's going to look at it. Yeah. I mean, um, case in point now that um, reference to Darko made is like, I got fed up because um, I ran the project locally and when you're running in the IDE, it's just like, run and compile it, but then there was the issue with there's a config file and with specifically C Shop and .NET and debug mode, it actually compiles and copies it yeah. into a directory. And I forgot to actually change the file type to be copied upon compile, so it wasn't in the test directory, so it was failing. So I said, screw this, let me just take a shortcut mm -hmm. and put the absolute path as a string variable in, yeah. um, which I've now changed. Exactly, exactly. So it's, it's the things, yeah. it's the little things. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, a question, for, oh, well, a comment from Ari. Uh, Ari Palo is, uh, is, uh, is a member of the AWS community. He mm -hmm. loves uh, our infrastructure code. I, I get to chat with him a, a bunch of those things. Mm -hmm. Code reviews are also a great way to spread knowledge, right? Uh, so, that, so that the project is not only just known by a single person. Exactly. So if you get people in your team to review other people's commits, mm -hmm. you actually know what people commit to the code rather than just making a pull request and, like, and looking at it at one point. So um, mm -hmm. I, think, I, think it's, I think it's a really, really great thing. So thank you, thank you for the comment, Adi. Um, um, Lydia, I'm six. You twins? We are not twins. We we look alike, and we we make a meme meme, meme out of it. But thank you, uh, thank you for noticing. Mm -hmm. as, as people say locally, is my brother from another mother. Exactly, exactly. We even had like a once a long time ago, somebody just raid our stream because they saw the stream from some other channel, and the girl on that stream was commenting, "Are we like, why are we the same person?" So it, it's weird. Mm. So it, it, it's just yeah. a stupid meme. Um, Mm. Petar Iliev, hey Darko. Oh, okay. Thank you very much for the for the comment. This this one is coming on YouTube. Um, you cannot watch me now, but please up more, upload more videos. Yes, there will be more videos on YouTube. I'm yes. working on a few, so um, my YouTube channel is somewhere somewhere here. Uh, actually, let me remove this thing. It's uh, yeah, there. We go. And let me get the banner away. The banner. So many uh, clicky yeah. banners. There we go. Yeah. So this is being streamed through all to all of the locations. So if you want to check out mm. any of our content, it's 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 just there. So. And there should be more coming soon. Yeah. yeah. Um, and um, and then a and then and 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 a b b uh, or an app. Um, um, just a comment between uh, yes, one of the things mm -hmm. about DevOps that we mentioned before, the book called Phoenix Project. There is also the DevOps Handbook. It's a lovely yellow book coming along with the same book. Mm. Uh, well, not with the same book, but you can purchase it as a, as, a, as an addition to it. It it actually helps you explain what is DevOps and how to implement it into your organization. So an excellent read. Mm. Um, another comment from Dan this, MBA. This is a very, very valid comment. Um, this is one of the things like um, you often get people that criticize those who want to teach others as a, hey, you're, it's a cop out because yeah. you don't know how to build systems. So now you're going to pretend and t teach people how it where Actually, when you have to explain something to someone who doesn't understand, yeah. um, that's actually where you prove if you know it deeply or not. And even better, we actually learn it. Um, Great example of this is like I've been coding for cheap as I'm in this one 16, 17 years now, as in full time. Yeah. Um, and 
if I need to explain something, there are so many things that I've picked up over the time that I need to fix. For example, um, I'm working on this code base. I need to uh, do something with string literals. Yeah. I might assume you know about that, whereas you go like, what the hell are string literals? Mm -hmm. um, I know how to, if I've got a string, I know I need to use a format instead of just like plus quote equal plus quote equal type syntax. They're all of these kind of things. And when you explain it to someone um, and they go, but what's this funny dollar before the string? And then I see a right. variable in the string without, uh, what's that? Then it's like, okay, cool, let me explain to you quickly. This is how string interpolation works with the formatter, with these things. These are caveats with it. This is why you would use yeah. it. Um, for example, if you go to the Java world, strings are interesting with regards to memory usage and how they handle. Um, you only pick that up over the time. So definitely chat to the people and explain why things are being done a certain way. Again, it's a really, I, would, I wouldn't call it cheap, but the, one of the cheaper ways to find bugs in your code, to find those mistakes mm -hmm. that you potentially, because your code might work in your browser, in your editor, in your local thing. Absolutely. But it might not work properly as you should later on, right? So that's one of one of the non-automated ways, but relatively quick way to detect uh, a potential mm. problem. So good. Okay, um, moving on. So we, we talked about detecting issues in your uh, text editor, your ID, where you will actually get your mm. messages, syntax error online, whatever. Um, then we, we moved on to detecting things uh, during a code review, right? Where your colleague, where your fellow junior developer or whoever looks at your code and says, oh boy, um, I think you made a boo-boo here, so you should fix it. You know, they deny your pull request. Then we go into the world of automated testing. This is where the fun begins. This is where the actual scale comes into play. So um, let me actually put my, pull my screen up uh, again. So these things are colloquially called, and I'm sure all of you have heard of these things, they're called unit tests, right? So unit tests are just a lovely way of doing, well, basically testing is my code doing what I want it to do. So it, it, it's, it's, it's TDD, uh, um, hell on earth this. So, um, or hell on near all of this. Um, so <laughs> it's test-driven development, basically writing a test that sets some assertions. Basically, you, you create assertions, you define things before you do them, you create, hey, I want my piece of code to export. So I want my code to say, hello world. Here's an example. This is a unit test written by, by, by myself. By the way, uh, for those of you not seeing the screen right now, all of the code will be available on the GitHub repo somewhere mm. later on. So, um, this is, is a piece of code that basically defines a test. Hey, here's a test that I expect that my Python code basically has a result of status code 200. The headers are basically JSON and that the result, the body of my response is a hello world, right? And if I look at my, index, my, my Python thing, I can see that it actually returns 200. The body is, oh, sorry, the headers are application JSON and the body is some data. Now watch me fail this test. So let me actually go into this directory, testing the code to unit test. If I do, uh, uh, there was this thing, I forgot the name of the thing, test. Yes, so it is discover tests. If I just do this, if I run python-m unit tests, discover tests, it's gonna say, hey, you have failed. So. The failure here, now again, just a caveat, this is Python, but it, the same concepts apply to any language out there, most any language. But here's the thing, I am current. I have currently failed my test, even though my code perfectly works, right? The problem here is my code, instead of hello world, up outputs zdravo svete, which is Serbian for hello world. Um, it, it works, it's a perfectly fine piece of code, it would run, but it's not doing what I want it to do. So unit testing basically gives you the ability to implement test-driven mm. development or a way where, Kobus, well, so in your use case, right? So you, how did you create your unit test? Tell me about it. I want to, I want to hear your thought process on this. How, how did you, or how, well, do you, how do you want to approach this? <clears throat> there, there tends to be two main ways that I do it. Um, the first one is that I start off with some tests of what I expect the behavior to be. Um, so, for example, I was busy with the YouTube videos. Um, it's able to process multiple channels, but I don't own all the channels, nor are all the videos on the channels mine. So, for my personal channel, it's easy. Take all of the videos. Yeah. Except 
there are sometimes some videos that are not, let's say, AWS related or work related that I don't want. So I need to be able to exclude them. So I wrote the test on how would I call this method to actually exclude values. Then on the other side for channels where we do shared content, like let's say our not is not darker channel. Most of it is both of our content, but every now and again, there may be a video that's just you or just me. And I only want my videos. I'm not interested in your video analytics at this point in time. So I right. then figured out how do we go about building an include filter where I say, here's a channel, but only include the include these that I specify. And I built the test in terms of what I want um, with some sample data and then an uh, empty method with a, it even throws an exception says, saying not implemented. Right. Um, and then I start hacking at the code and coding and figuring out how I do this, all of that, then get to a point where the tests actually are green and they work. So my base assumptions are now this works the way I want it to. So that's feature development. Then the other type of test that I tend to do is like as I go along, like we did yesterday, where I didn't think about checking for um, white spaces in the video ID. Um, yeah. That would be something where afterwards I figured out something's broken. And then I go write a test to first assert that I know why it's breaking and how it's breaking to test those conditions. Then I go and fix the code. Yeah. Uh, because what happens here is that let's say I put some kind of fix in there or um, what I'm doing is I'm using a, um, I want to say it's actually a Visual Basic library inside .NET um, for reading a CSV file that allows you to read um, commas separated with commas in quotes, those kind of things, because I don't want to deal with it. But my file has got the first two lines are junk data in the sense that right. stuff I don't want because it's the column headers as well as the total. Oh, second, second. So, okay, cool. Um, and what I did there is that, so I've got two lines there saying read line, read line, and then only do I go into the logic that loops over each row and process it. So I've got a comment in there saying, listen, this is why I'm doing this, but I also need to have a test that actually tests correctly saying it needs to be junk data. Otherwise, um, you lose that um, that the context there and Correct. that's the problem. Um, uh, one of the things I, I j jumped up uh, was to grab a book about on test-driven development, right? And there's a bunch of comments here, lovely comments from the folks here mm. um, uh, about test-oriented development and test-driven development. Uh, mm. one, one of the, one of the th things I've, I've learned from this book, and I'm trying to find the quote right now, is that the exactly thing you do, you make a test, you make mm. an assertion, then you work on your code to pass that test. That's it. Like yes. nothing more than that, because this gives and you and the least possible code, least possible code. Exactly. This gives you lean, yep. efficient code mm. to do it. So it's not about uh, like, oh, I'm going to write my code and I'm going to just write some tests to make sure it's 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 it works. That's no, yeah, no, no. Write your tests and then write your code again. I will make us like if I had no code here, right? So if, if I had uh, an empty function here, I would come to my test handle, write, hey, this is what I want. I want my output to include hello world. Mm -hmm. Then I go back to my index py and make it output hello world. Yeah, that's it. I don't complicate yeah. things. I don't introduce unnecessary, you know, pieces of code or unnecessary functions and classes and methods. This, right? By the way, the book, this is a, a old book from 2003 or one, I'm not sure. It's uh, Test Driven wow. Development by Kent Beck. It's it's the book on test driven development. It, it's great. It's it's Java focused, though. But you no, you'll apply that one. The, yeah, you'll apply all the learnings from this one to that. So uh, for sure. So yeah, uh, test driven development. Why why this? Because again, gives you this as as Twitch as Twitch Loft said here. The main benefit of test driven development is shortening the feedback loop. So important for being very effective. So the feedback loop from this code actually not mm. doing what I want. So if I had no test driven development here, if I had no test on this, and I publish this code and it builds and it commit and it and it packages and it goes through production and it's all fine. All of a sudden, all of my customers instead of getting hello world, they're getting a zdravo svete, which is not what I wanted, right? So it's not the thing I really wanted out there, even though it's perfectly good code. So. Mm. Um. Quick, uh, before we get to um, Uncodable's question around that, um, that book that Darkon I mentioned, I actually don't have a physical copy of that mm -hmm. one. I, I've definitely read it. But there's this whole, you'll see the, the books kind of look the same. Uh, let's see if we can get them there. Um, it's, the yeah, it's the same publisher. Martin Fowler's signature series. I mean, there are yeah. a whole bunch of them um, that I find super useful. So um, the one, I want to say, these are all about patterns. So at some point, I went through like large code bases. So I read a lot about patterns. So um, we'll dump the links actually afterwards because I don't want to bore you too much about that. Yeah. But one that I found super useful was actually this book. Um, 
Let me put the details Rest there. Rest in practice. practice. Wow. So obviously we have moved on. We have got GraphQL and other API mechanisms, but it really teaches you how to think about your code, which was awesome. And then this is also a really, really good book um, because not all of us are going to be able to just work on clean code bases that we start from scratch. Um, you often have to work on, on a code base that's existing, which immediately means it's legacy, which isn't bad. It just means yeah. it's a system that actually does what it's supposed to and makes money. Um, yeah. Because how many of you have actually hit a legacy code base which wasn't in use? Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Okay. But um, <laughs> to get to this uh, question quickly, um, <clears throat> uh, what happens if you change how you achieve the logic and then runs a test against how it solves a certain type of data, data um, uh, units, uh, IOC, uh, inversion of code? Uh, I'm assuming what you're doing over here. Um, so this is where things become interesting because then you have to look at your test. Uh, if you, Measurement. let's say change, because at the end of it, your app is supposed to do something. Now, how it does mm -hmm. that in the middle might be up to a specific implementation. But if you've got the top one, and if you're using, for example, language where we've got interfaces like uh, Java or C Sharp, you define the interface, you've got defined your current class with the current way it's doing it. You've got tests that test against that. You should also have tests that actually test the interface as a whole. Because yeah. then what you can do is you can go bold and use new methods like inversion of um, uh, control, uh, injecting um, your classes, all of those fancy things, and then actually still make sure that it works at the end of the day because the functionality at the top level should be the same. And when you get yeah. to the point where that passes and you've got tests for the internal part of the code um, that also pass, then you can say, okay, cool. Now the old ones classes or tests will fail because I've changed them, then remove them or change them to actually test it. But also, here's the point: uh, when you do, when you change the uh, logic, right? Uh, you make a mm -hmm. different, you make a change in logic. Number one, have a reason to do so, right? That can be mm -hmm. a number of things. That can be just, oh, we're upgrading to a new firmware; it has a better option to do it. Excellent. Also, this is where where your code metrics come in. Like you understanding is this faster execution than it was before? If it is, why not? Unless it introduces mm -hmm. some additional negative sides. So, it's it's good. Again, you want to achieve the same result at the end of the day. The thing you need to be careful on when refactoring is just make sure you achieve it in the same amount of resources and time. So, you know, mm. um, try to make it as lean as possible because ultimately you're not doing it because for, for anybody else but for you because you're going to be maintaining that. Mm. And also just quickly on that, don't optimize too early. Um, yeah. And also know that certain apps do not need to be optimized. A good example of this is I know I'm using a for loop inside a for loop inside a for loop um, yeah. that could potentially, potentially run through a few hundred thousand entries, but it doesn't matter because I know what the upper end of the scale is going to be and yeah. it's still within a half second, so it doesn't matter. But some, sometimes you have to do that. Sometimes you have to have recur recursive for loops. That's just mm. the way you do. So it's it's not, yeah. it, it looks bad, but it's it's a thing you have to do. So that's oh, yeah. fine. And, and a good point here by, by hello, uh, hello near this. Um, uh, the Apollo space program would write tests in the morning and code in the afternoon. Many de developers think that's mm. if they lost. Oh, it's no, 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 not. No. It's not. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Oh, mm -mm. boy. Um, because if you write good tests, and mind you, this is a person, this is coming from a person who's not a developer, but I have committed production code to AWS. If I write a good test, I don't have to worry about my, my code not working because my test is half of the thing, right? I have a, a, a thing that, have, that will verify will my ultimate java code work in production so it, it, it is it is really good so mm. no no definitely i mean it's uh this is also a good comment here by twitch um okay. that's it's easier to decouple the test from the actual implementation when doing tdt rather than when writing the test of the code and this is so true i mean i literally fell in this trap i think yesterday um or i think friday when i was coding uh, where I'd written something and then I realized, okay, I don't want to make sure that this works yeah. the way I wanted to. And I realized I didn't write in a way that allows it to test, which means it wasn't broken down small enough into <laughs> discrete functions um, or methods, um, which is, yeah, it makes you a better coder by implementing tests. Um, yeah, absolutely. And um, let's actually just kind of slowly wrap up on this topic because I want to answer a question here by Mr. or Mrs. CX. How would you uh, test-driven develop an RNG device or random number random number generator device? It's easy. You just want to know what is coming out of that device, or um, you know, if your RNG. I have an example here. I have a. I written this as an integration test, but it doesn't really matter. So I have an API that uh, basically outputs Unix time. 
So it gives me a random, a random, sorry, it's not random, it's sequential. It's, it's, but in, in a point in time, it's a random set of numbers. And I cannot never ever say that, oh, um, is this time, is this number correct? Because it's just the number I get. What, although, but what I can do is I can make sure that this number is a float, that it isn't a number. The thing I get back is a number. It's a number, maybe I can t test how many digits does it have, right? I have hmm. certain assertions I can make. Uh, it doesn't have to be a fixed value. It's an assertion that you want something. For example, Cobus can test, does the uh, YouTube ID that he gets back is 16 characters long? Or this is the regular expression that will show how my uh, YouTube ID should look like. Mm. If it doesn't, then something may be wrong. So you may get dumb, uh, junk data back, which is not something you want. So that's a way you can do... Yeah. Um, um, that's a way you could do like a test driven development for something that you really don't know the outcome from, but you kind of know what you are getting, like what form of data you're getting back. Mm. No, and also just quickly there, the comment uh, from Uncodable, um, uh, sorry, was Uncodable? I saw here something about testing uh, RNG system. Uh, here we go. Uh, sorry, it was from uh, CX. CX. Um, so here's a fun thing. There are actually certifications for random number generated systems out there. And if you're yeah. working on in certain industries, you have to have them. Um, have and how you actually device. test it is, is that you test all the values that it generates uniformly distributed or yeah. not. Because if it's doing random, it's actually very hard. It's like yeah. one of those fun problems where it's like being really random is hard. Because yeah. um, it has to be uniformly distributed. And just a fun example of this, I believe it's, um, is it, uh, what's the company name? Uh, they have the DNS 1111 um, um, brain, brain fart. Cloudflare. Uh, Fastly. Fastly. Fastly actually has. Um, is, is it Cloudflare or Fastly? Cloudflare. Uh, could be. Um, for some reason, I've got in my brain that it's Fastly who's got the, the wall of lava lamps, where they've got an entire wall with, I think it's a 16 by 16 grid of lava lamps that they then yeah. use a camera with to actually generate the um, uh, random numbers, which is a super yeah. interesting thing to look at. Um, the the, the yeah, most uh, incredible. Yeah, yeah, the most the most yeah. random number out there that you can get right now is coming from physics labs. They do background mm. space radiation to to determine yeah. random numbers, and and it's and it's weird. Uh, it's weird because like you think a random number is something simple. It's something simple you can get from your computer. I can go into my Linux mm. system and get DevU rand, but that also relies on the amount of entropy I have on my system and whatnot. Uh, all yep. the, all those things, but. To, like I I I, dev, I developed a, an assembly la, assemb, assembly language program for my Commodore sixty four. It is very difficult to get a random number from a Commodore sixty four, just like that. You have to have a routine to do that for you. Like it doesn't have a random number generator inside of it built. You have to do it yourself. So it, it's it's weird. Yeah. So RNGs mm. are, are fun. Oh, um, yeah. But um, sorry, just uh, hello on Earth. Um, just quickly, the comment around uniformly distributed is, is not random. The thing is, you don't want a random number system that clumps around certain numbers. Yeah. Because then you know that that'll be, you can attack the system that way. And it's actually, um, coming back to another comment here from Uncodable around gambling systems, there was a very yeah. interesting story, if you go search for um, it, where they figured out the uh, RNG generated for a slot machine. And there was actually a syndicate that abused them. And the only way they picked it up is they're saying, like, listen, the payouts for our systems on average across thousands of units or hundreds of thousands of units is not what our stats determine it should be. What's going yeah. on there? And then they figured out they actually figured out how to crack the RNG generator and then yeah. know when it's going to bet and then or pay out and then bet big. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So um, so let's slowly wrap up this because we're close into the hour. So I'll just like oh, to yeah. answer a couple of more questions here on chat. So there's a, ch a question from Elliot. Hey, Darko and Kobus, uh, the day of today, uh, the day of today shouldn't biz business project uh, of day of, oh, of day to day um, uh, be forced to have tests and be tested automatically on another machine, CI other user. I know a lot of environments where things mm. went wrong due to not having tests, even with dependencies, I don't know what went wrong. Um, Oh, exactly. Yeah. So, so there are unit tests. The, the unit test you've seen me show here on screen is a simple unit test that can run on my machine. It literally just expects an output from a Python function. Nothing special. Mm. But once you get more into advanced things like integration testing, load testing, 
end user acceptance testing. Those kind of things require to run in a pipeline. Of course, your unit test will run in a pipeline. It makes it cheaper to fail in the first step of the pipeline than it is in on integration, right? But you doing those things at scale will definitely have to do on, 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 a, on a CI system um, rather than your own laptop. You will not run an integration test on your on your workstation because it it, it doesn't make a lot of sense. So uh, uh, uh. Kevin, you, you can. can. You can, um, you can, absolutely I, you can, but be careful. It all depends <laughs> on the type of test. Yeah, um, depends how you do your things, because I um, used to work on a system where we um, ran what we call smoke tests afterwards, which is a basic known code execution path, or at least a set of things that you want to do yeah. just to see if the smoke comes out of the system, breaking it or not. Yes. Um, um, and what it boiled down to is that it did a login to check if you can get the API key, then did a number of status checks, as well as a transaction on a specific account yeah that we know is a test account so that it doesn't affect the rest of the data. So we know that the code path actually works through all the different systems. And you can do that on production uh, even, yep. yeah. Yep. Yeah. Excellent. So I think this is a really good point for us to kind of stop talking about tests. We have not covered all the tests, right? We have talked about your IDs, your bug, <coughs> your code reviews, your unit tests. Now join us next week on, we're not done yet, but next week on Wednesday, we're going to continue talking about software development mm. and testing. So we're going to talk about uh, 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 integration tests, maybe some smoke testing. And also one important thing is testing the code in production. Does it actually do what it wants to do? So um, those kind of things are also going to be under mm. discussion next week. So uh, I appreciate all of the amazing comments and, and the, and oh, the no, interactions it's, it's, with it's the folks fun, here. Yeah. So thank you all for, for chatting. Thank you all for, uh, for asking questions. That's what we're here for, right? So uh, mm. uh, we have like uh, around 10-ish minutes left until the end of the stream. So let's let's step back from software development and let's just, I want to ask you, Kobus. Kobus, what is the fun technical thing you've been working on? You mentioned this lovely project you're working on, this piece of oh, code. Yeah. Tell me more about it. I want to hear. Oh, it is. Um, if, you've, if you've been looking at my Twitter feed, you might have seen me rant about not being able to parse a cookie in C Sharp. <laughs> Um, which ended up not being my code. And here's a very fun example of uh, testing and things. So I literally, um, I used uh, Rider, which is a IDE by JetBrains, uh, because I used to use ReShop when I did C Shop and I did uh, IntelliJ back in the day as well. So it's just yeah. my IDE of choice. And I literally said, I haven't used C Shop for two years. Let me fire it up again. I used to enjoy it a lot. Install Rider, click New Project. I said console application, .NET Core, and it goes. And by default, it selected uh, .NET uh, 5.0 as the SDK for it. Now, I still have to go dig into my understanding is that before 5, I'm not sure what happened before, but uh, with it was .NET Core, um, 3 point something or version 1, version 2, version 3. And then there was .NET, which is the non-core multi-platform one up until I think 4.8. And then with 5, it sounds like it's unified, but I might be completely wrong. Yeah, I haven't dug into it, but that is my understanding at least where they're heading. Um, so it had .NET, um, .NET 5 installed, and the code just would not work. I kept getting auth error against this internal system, and I knew the, the cookie, because how it works is there's a system that generates a cookie, and we use the values from the cookie then to Correct. proceed with other API calls. Um, so I know the cookie is working because I can make the call in Python by just loading the cookie, and my .NET Core code wouldn't work. So what I decided is, okay, cool, let's downgrade to an older version, .NET Core 3.1 in this case, and magically the code just started working. Um, so that's something where... I'm assuming this might be an edge case where the code is being tested or it's a platform difference or there might be something. And having had a test, now that I've picked up this issue, would be useful to try and figure out where this problem came in. Um, <clears throat> so that's useful. Um, the, the project itself is fairly simple. It's just one that uh, pulls data from somewhere, processes the, uh, the statistics and or the stats of the different things and then you know aggregates them and does things with them. Um, but the main thing is like I start off just like writing a whole bunch of code and then halfway through, I'm, well, not halfway through, like, Let's say two days in, I start realizing, I don't know if this is actually going to do what it's supposed to. And if I start testing it as a whole now, there might be so many bugs in so many places it could be broken. I'm not going to know which part is broken when it does break. I can obviously debug it, but guess what? That's not a great experience. So I started writing tests just to cover what I had written. And now what I'm doing is I'm now back into TDD mode where uh, when I have a new feature, I first go write the test, make sure I know. Okay. And that also helps me reason about the behavior because it makes me think through, okay, so if it does this and that and then this, what about this? What about that? Um, and then write the test first and then do the code. Yep, yep. Uh, it, it helps so much, right? I mean, mm. we all love those debug print statements in our code just to see if it's working. Why are you not doing this? So yeah, uh, but oh, excellent. excellent. I, 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 again, Kobus and I still have to test the version 0 0.2 of his application. So uh, I'm looking forward oh, to it. Oh, it's already 0.3. 
Zero point three. Okay, wow, we have moved, mm. moved on. Oh yeah. So tomorrow, tomorrow, I, I hopefully have a look at zero point three or zero point four, depending on what happens today. Um, so yeah, uh, Twitch off. Um, a, a comment from him uh, comes here uh, saying that uh, clear definition for, of unit tests versus integration tests with or without mocks, acceptance tests, etc. would be nice. I feel like most devs have a slightly different view of these definitions. Okay, mm. so next week we're gonna try to define these things okay. in our own words. So again, but take little pinch of salt with that it's our own views of this from our experience so we're going to try to make, be very clear what they are but it depends <laughs> so so yeah um so make sure to join us next week wednesday at the same time at the same place mm. so um be sure to be here uh f you know hit that bell subscribe whatever button follow us on twitters we we post if mm. if if there's a change in time Follow us on, on the social medias. You can find us Ooh. on LinkedIn, Twitter. We, yes. we usually tell if some changes happen there. Quickly. Um, so on that note, we are heading into the month of madness, which is known as the month of March, as well as normally October, which is yeah. daylight savings change over time, which is always fun for me being as... Oops, sorry. I also kicked my table. Um, being in South Africa, we don't have daylight savings. Uh, Darko is in Europe, which does have daylight savings. Yeah. And Twitch is scheduled from the US side, which also has daylight savings. <laughs> And I'm still trying to wrap my head around exactly what day it is because it seems to be different days for different areas. Yeah. But from the 17th of March, so two weeks from now, we're going to be shifting to one hour. Well, in theory, we're going to be shifting one hour early, depending where in the world you yeah. are, um, if you're Southern or Northern Hemisphere. But the time will change. But keep an eye on the actual yeah. Twitch schedule for that, and we'll tweet out exactly the time. Actually, actually, looking at the thing right now, I'm checking my calendar, and next week I will not be able to make this time slot. So we will move it one hour early. So instead yes. of 1 p.m. Central European time, it's going to be 12. It's going to be noon Central European time. So next yep. Wednesday. And now, again, we'll keep it We'll keep it all updated in the, on the Twitch, on LinkedIn. Uh, we have even a site, devbeardops.com. It's empty right now. Don't, don't, <laughs> don't, don't, don't give too much into it. We're, we're still trying to put code there. So uh, Twitch has the calendar widget. Uh, mm. I believe if you look at the, uh, the AWS Twitch, there should be like a, a, a schedule on it. Just so, add, yeah, yeah, just add slash schedule to the URL. So twitch.tv slash yeah. AWS slash schedule. Yeah, you um, should be able to see the schedule there. So... Yeah. Um, and, and, and there's a lot of people on this same Twitch channel doing a lot of great stuff. So it's not just us. Mm. So, uh, if you're watching from the official AWS Twitch channel, but, um, also make sure to hit the follow on ours because, Hey, if we're not streaming to the official AWS Twitch, we're streaming on our uh, Twitch channels, which is Kobus Bernard and Rob 12. So yeah. Um, cool. Cool. This was really fun. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Everybody. I, I enjoy this thing. Um, I enjoy the the audience interactions thank you for all of the amazing mm. questions comments and make sure to join us next wednesday at 12 p.m central european time we're just gonna switch to you next time um and uh, uh, join us here at the same time same place where we get to talk about we're gonna explain the uh, we're gonna define what the unit tests are what acceptance tests are what integration tests are um and we are gonna also um talk about integration tests, smoke tests, and of course, production tests later on. Mm. Okay. And also, just lastly, quickly, this live video will be available as soon as we hit the end broadcast button on exactly. our YouTube channel, which is below me here, somewhere over here. Not uh, the not code is not darker. That is actually a channel name. Um, <laughs> so you can go there and actually get the video again if you want to rewatch it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your time. And um, yeah, enjoy the rest of your week. Kobus, enjoy the rest of your coding. Uh, <laughs> I will. And I'll go get some coffee now. Get some coffee, yeah. Uh, and everybody else, well, have a really nice Wednesday and see you, well, next Wednesday. Bye-bye. Yeah, cool. Adios.